What we're going to do in this session is to, I'll get the uh, facilitators from this morning's sessions to give us a pricey of what was raised in each of those individual groups. And then we'll open up for both a combination of questions and also any comments or any input anyone wants to have about this. What we'd like to get to in the end, I mean, everything, there's a potential for a lot of this to be very abstract, to try to get to the point where we can speak fairly specifically about what has been discussed so far and what the potential outcomes may be for Australia and what are the road, what is the road map to moving some of those things forward. So first of all, we'll just begin with a, a bit of a rundown of what happened in each of the sessions today uh, from each of our facilitators. Uh, we'll start with Robert. Robert. Thank you, Stan. Um, we had an incredibly rich conversation described at one point as a fruit salad. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm going to try and reduce the fruit salad to four points. Juice um, it. Juice the fruit salad to four points. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So probably the most important thing to say um, was a strong uh, endorsement of the importance of the Uluru Statement as unfinished business coming from an authentic process from the group. Um, so um, there was a strong sense that we need not to be advancing, interesting and stimulating, though all the input has been uh, there was a strong kind of sentiment about not uh, dropping the ball on that um, and not letting government off the hook on that. Um, uh, so the conversation in that domain uh, quickly moved to how to go forward and there was quite a lot of discussion about the question of voice. Um, um, a, a, a sophisticated and, and um, textured discussion which I can't do full um, service to um, which um, explored the notion of um, voice being rooted in identity and personal jurisdiction uh, and community, not some simple national representative kind of question. Um, uh, a notion of starting at something like uh, a regional uh, building block um, acknowledging that regions themselves are problematic and that populations in different parts of the country are very differently constituted and in some places we might be talking about men's and women's and children's and old people's sort of tables as a building block. In other places it might be about uh, uh, nation identity, language, uh, place. Um, um, there was a sense there also about not ignoring um, existing structures and again the importance, so, so Congress was discussed and the importance of the peaks, um, but also the PBCs came up again and the importance um, in, in the post-determination of world of actually um, acknowledging the importance that PBCs will play and the need for resources uh, to make that even a possibility. Um, um, there's a kind of tension here which was acknowledged in the room between, on the one hand, a kind of just do it sentiment um, and a great disappointment um, that government and the parliament haven't taken up the challenge, um, um, with a, a, a strong sense about the pace has to be, though, the right place and start at a grassroots level, not on a top-down level. And so there's a potential tension between those two in terms of timing which in the end the group decided to sit with. I don't think the group had a resolution for that. Um, um, it, it, the closest to a proposal uh, on this question was a process, was sort of coming up with a proposal for a process, um, which might be quite well defined and would be constructed so as to pay respect to the issues I've just gone through. Um, three other points more quickly about governance. Um, there was a lot of discussion about the importance of governance, about the importance of agencies, the good news that flows from jurisdiction, um, um, including that when people have to deal with you, uh, then good things come from that. Um, an example being the way in which the resources sector in various post-colonial nations of the world has turned around from being very hostile to getting into um, the reality of agreement making and good things have flowed from that. Um, on the flip side, the absence of agency is still 
a shocking um, burden on Aboriginal communities around the country. Um, and people talked about um, very personal kind of experience of witnessing the pain that flows from that and the shocking inability of government and all its agencies to actually listen. Um, um, second point about um, governance. Um, governance is not a panacea, so there was quite a lot of talk about this is an important conversation but it doesn't supplant conversations about land, the importance of um, leveraging uh, opportunity from uh, land um, um, and pragmatic kind of progress in the range of concrete things around health, education, community, economic development and so on. Um, um, there was now Miriam, one of our panellists, quoted from someone else whose name I forget, um, practices crystallise into rights. So the way in which we engage in the concrete and pragmatic world of progress is governance building. Um, um, and the last point about governance, governance not, is not linear. Um, there's a lot of healing and nation building work to do both inside Indigenous communities and in non-Indigenous Australia. Um, um, and we, there was a reference to, again, one of Miriam's terms, oblique uh, progress that Somebody said yesterday about la launching an armada and hoping some ships land on a shore. Um, uh, um, there was a very strong sentiment here about um, government is not the place to start the conversation about governance. Governments have to be drawn into a conversation about governance, but the thing about Uluru was that it started somewhere else. Um, and so then the stage of teasing out um, has to not be lost from community. Um, and, the, and the last point was a point about celebrating success. A lot of what uh, the kind of building of coalition and wider community support in some ways being rooted in the kind of constant deluge of bad news and the uh, resilient refusal of many in the media to celebrate or publicise success and strength um, in the Aboriginal community. Thank you. Carla. Um, Interestingly, but probably not surprisingly, there, were, there was quite a lot of alignment um, amongst the groups. Uh, certainly, I think, uh, with everything being on the table, we've, we found that we still did centre around those options that had come out of Uluru quite, quite firmly. Um, again, I think to reflect what you've said there, there was a fair bit of tension around timing. So whose agenda are we being driven by and for what purpose? And a need to recognise taking the opportunity to ride uh, a wave of momentum um, but also taking the time to do things when it makes sense for us and in a way that makes sense for us. And the young people in the room urged us um, not to feel the need to push ahead for the sake of it in order to hand over something that was finished but rather to take a, a multi-generational approach to such big pieces of change and that they would rather inherit I guess, the fight, then inherit something they then had to go back and try and fix uh, at a later point in time. With respect to ordering the action that w it was felt was required, uh, I think noting there too that these concurrent approaches are really important, that we can't take a very linear view of what should be done next and then comes next and then comes next, but rather recognise that we are at a point in time that is a part of a very long journey that will continue much further after we've handed the baton on, um, but that we can, uh, with an understanding of the here and now, of the political climate, of the social climate, of the cultural climate of our country and what's happening internationally, um, make some very informed decisions about the sorts of change we go for in the near future. Uh, with that in mind, the order of the action, if there is to be one, our, our conversation centred a little bit away from uh, constitutional reform as the next step and towards the establishment of uh, a body that would, or, or a, um, a well, body is a good word, that a Makarata Commission, if you like, um, that could start to look at furthering the work of healing and education and understanding both amongst our own population and, and amongst the broader Australian population about the need for this work. Um, 
uh, it was very important amongst the group that that was an independently funded and brought together body and that it was representative, but I think to your point too, the, the rep how that representative structure might be formed was, was a conversation to come later. Um, it, it was discussed that this could be a, a redefinition or, or a subsuming of those responsibilities by an existing body, um, but there was some thought in the room that it was also necessary for, for that to be something new that was established um, that had somewhat of a clean slate or a clean mandate to do this piece of work. Largely, the idea of uh, healing and uh, education and narrative change was important. They fell out as quite important key next steps uh, for, for our group. I hope I've done our group some justice there, and I'm very, very sure that you will tell me if I haven't. Dan. Uh, Stan, thank you. Uh, we began our discussion uh, from a point of intergenerational trauma and the effects that that still has uh, and from there leapfrogging directly into uh, what are the ways that that can either be addressed or is already being addressed and heard examples from South Australia, from Western Australia of land-based bodies that are uh, working uh, already from a foundation point of uh, economic development while also uh, addressing those issues around intergenerational trauma. And it was very clear that there was a line within our, or a linear thinking about self-governance being at the core and that that being the outcome or at least the next destination. And looking, so we looked at a number of different ways of getting there through regional bodies that are land-based, but as it was pointed out, what happens if there hasn't been a successful native title agreement? what then? So we talked about different models that could be addressed and could be engaged uh, in to do that. Uh, there was also a, a big discussion about um, whether or not the, uh, the voice is something that should sit in or outside of the constitution, whether or not that's a body that uh, should be set up or established and funded by the government, or in fact if that's something that should be uh, funded and established from grassroots. There was a really strong comment from uh, Dame Tariana Turia who said, no one will ever give you power, you have to decide how you'll take that back. And that was the point, I think, at which when we began the second uh, stage of our discussions and deliberations, where we were discussing where to from here, what are the points, and that was where the self-government point came out. It was also noted that recognition in the Constitution has been seen as a bit of a, a blip uh, while we're still building a relationship between nation states and the Commonwealth or other nation states as it was. Uh, and also that truth telling has to be at the core and at the centre of everything. So we had uh, quite a bit of time discussing how that would happen, uh, what that would look like and the mechanisms uh, that would need to be uh, in, put in place for that. Uh, we also heard then what are the, some of the substantive reforms that, that are on, are on the table or indeed should be on the table. Uh, questions about representation, of course, we talked about the next federal election and how the last one was decided arguably by a handful of marginal seats in places like Queensland with big Indigenous populations. So if you can galvanise the support of those voters, can you decide an election outcome? And if that's the way that it's going, going to go, do you do an agreement with that party ahead of time and then come knocking the day after the election? It was noted that if there's to be a referendum, the next day is the most important because that's when the real work gets started of deciding and the negotiations, the deliberations that would follow through uh, from there. There was also a lot of talk about uh, mechanism, using the mechanisms within government, COAG, uh, deliberations between state, territory governments and the Commonwealth uh, as well. Uh, there was a call for the reintroduction of a social justice package, which we talked about for some time. At the core of that, uh, really looking at uh, how you engage in uh, different uh, issue-based matters around the country, remote area housing being uh, one of those, but of which uh, there were many. Uh, and it has to be noted there, there were some within the group uh, saying this is a conversation that it seems to be rehashed every couple of years that we're going around the tree. I think five times was the number we'd, uh, it was decided upon uh, that there needs to almost be 
action, well, uh, definitely that there needs to be action now. Um, there was also a discussion about this assembly of First Nations, a voice, if you will, some sort of mechanism and where, how, how you would get uh, the legal the legal or the body politic around that established and what would that look like? There was even a discussion that we had around a 2% black tax that, you, that was said could be anything, any work being done on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land that would go into this sort of a body that then becomes the body politic that negotiates directly with the government. And we talked a lot about how would that be formed, what would that look like and what is the best model for that. So. Uh, that's a truncated version of <laughs> four hours. I know there's heaps that we haven't covered off on and I hope that uh, those that were in the group, uh, who I thank very much for your candour in, in our conversation, will be bringing up when we get chatting shortly. Great. Lorena? Thanks, Dan. Um, same as um, Dan, our group had a very broad-ranging discussion to start and then broke up into smaller groups and we didn't have a chance to come back together after that before everybody had to race to the press club. So I'm hoping that our... Our leaders, Michael, Linda and Ken, will add to what was discussed in more detail in the second session after this um, presentation. But I think there are some broad things that came out that I can go through here, and they are that we agreed that constitutional recognition was necessary, but is it the only game in town? Um, we're not necessarily trapped in any process, and that can be seen as a benefit to where we are now. But there was a plurality of processes and therefore uh, a plurality of options. Um, we didn't have, as Linda said, the luxury of a linear progression. We have to work on multiple fronts at the same time. Um, the options ranged from what we saw as the very long term or the almost impossible to recognising what structures we already have and building upon those, think, um, the ways that we already organise ourselves around governance. And the key thing that came out, I think, was that regional models were vital, that uh, people needed time to and resources particularly, to be able to organise themselves in the way they wanted to do on their country around issues that they saw as most important. And I think the, the example of Mildred and Namban was raised, uh, who are the two organisations that represent Aboriginal water rights on the Murray-Darling. Um, they represent about 75,000 Aboriginal people who live on that river system. And they are now, <coughs> excuse me, organising themselves around um, calling for water rights and the end to aquanullius, I guess. So, and that any process or processes is, is ongoing, that it, um, constitutional recognition is not an end, it's the beginning of a process, and that any process changes over time as goals are reached or we get close to. And that we needed to be prepared for the next day. The question, again, about leadership and generational change. What are we leaving unfinished for the next generation and how do we support an accountable leadership? And that all that sort of those questions needed to be resolved on a local, then a regional, then a national level. And that those processes would bring up the voice and um, people would then be able to represent themselves the way they wanted at that national level and talk to government. Um, and I, another thing Linda said that was really um, important was to don't yearn for what is absent, but to work for what is possible. Um, we talked about what a voice actually meant and how it's constructed and that we are a multiplicity of voices, kind of like a choir rather than a singular voice. And that searching for that singular voice sometimes blinds us to finding the per you know, a unity of purpose and, and discussing what is actually possible to be focused on solutions because communities are often doing magical things with absolutely nothing and that's the kind of work that we need to support. Um, and yes, and any solution we came to needed to involve self-determination at its fundamental point and the transfer of power, not just the administration of poverty. Thank you, Lorena. Um, so we can open this up now for questions. If anyone wants to drill down on some of the things that have been raised here and maybe uh, the facilitators can go into a little bit more detail about what was actually discussed. Or if anyone just feels as if they want to make a comment about what we've heard over the last couple of days, some of the issues that were raised in, uh, in those meetings. The difficulty, and we have about an hour left to do this, is we want to arrive at the end of this with something that the university can put forward that says, here's what was discussed, here are potential options, these are mechanisms for moving this discussion forward and beyond the walls of this room. Uh, I think they're just listening to the various 
sessions and the facilitators, Pracy, four points really emerged for me. One is the need for political architecture. Second is the representative structure that that architecture uh, takes. What are the options and the options beyond simply constitutional recognition, but and can those options exist concurrently? What are the priorities? How do you decide on those priorities? And the third, I think, was the strategic aspect of this, the alliance building, the political strategy, be it targeting seats, uh, building alliances beyond Indigenous communities that are necessary to move politics, uh, to move politicians to actually act on some of these ideas. So let's open it up for um, for discussion and any questions. I don't are there microphones? You have two of the micro two microphones, but two microphones, but one person, one runner. You're going to be busy. All right. Who wants to uh, to begin? Any any first questions or comments? Everyone's happy. <laughs> we can go. We can go home. <laughs> yeah, uh, Fred. Yeah, thank you. It would be a pity if we lost the final point that Mick Dodson made at the lunch, which was that one of the things he'd hoped, I think he said, this would come of this was that the government would reopen the door and start a genuine dialogue. I don't want to verbal him, though that they weren't his exact words, but I think that idea, I think, is really important. Um, what's, what's been absent ever since the, um, the expert panel has been government responsiveness. There was no response really to the expert panel. Uh, the committee's very muted response, refer it off to another committee. Uh, then we get a response to Uluru, the statement from the heart, which is shallow and, in my view, inaccurate. And um, reference off to another committee. So mm. what's needed is for government to take seriously the need to be in dialogue with the Aboriginal communities, and that's, I think, a really important point that shouldn't be lost mm. at the end of this conference. Is Les, Miles, oh, Les, would you be able to pick up on that? This goes to what you raised yesterday, particularly in the questions that you put forward, and that is this idea of what does government yield uh, and how do you negotiate with government when government ultimately is the adjudicator? You've been involved in this for a long time. What are the strategies that you would see of being able to open those doors, increase the capacity for that dialogue and create some leverage? Um, yes, thanks, Stan, for um, directing that uh, back to me. It was a rhetorical question when I asked it because I had some things... You knew the answer. ...in, in mind at time, <laughs> yes. And um, it hasn't received much mention here. We've heard a lot about the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a universal standard. But the outcome document from the World Conference of Indigenous Peoples, I think 2014 it was produced, was also a unanimous resolution of the General Assembly and it was an action-oriented document for implementing the rights of Indigenous peoples. And Australia was very much involved in the drafting of it and very much pushing on the actions on it. And our, um, our Foreign Affairs Minister, Julie Bishop, went over to the, uh, attend that conference and vote we're, along with the other states, to that a a action document. Now, in there, the key ones that uh, are relevant to this question, it, and someone mentioned it uh, earlier today in our group, I think, is um, there should be a national plan of action developed. That, in fact, the wording is, we as states commit ourselves to developing a plan of action in coordination with the national representation of the Indigenous peoples. And that's something that can be implemented, and someone has already mentioned that during this conference. Um, it also said that um, we uh, aim to raise the awareness of the parliamentarians and the judiciary and the bureaucracy about the rights of Indigenous peoples because one of the biggest problems in Australia, and personally I think is the biggest problem, is we have this conservatism that's inbuilt, uh, and I used the word colonialism the other day, it doesn't go down well in modern times, but remember it is a colonial institution developed in 1900, 1901 from the British to import the system of government into Australia, along with the courts uh, and so on. So I'm not uh, throwing them out, I'm just really saying remember that we are fighting against something that is institutionally built to um, defend um, the status quo of the nation, as we uh, uh, all seem to have 
been involved in. And um, so awareness of the parliamentarians is a very big part of everything that we've been talking about. That if we're going to get them to vote to do, even just to agree to a referendum, but also to legislate to ensure that rights are protected and contained and so on, that's got to happen. And then there's another one in there which I mentioned yesterday, which was that the states say, we commit ourselves to establish a mechanism to adjudicate disputes over land between Indigenous peoples in the state. And, you know, um, generally the process in Australia has been in different states and territories and at different times to take your claim, even native title call a claim, or it actually isn't a claim, it's a continuing right, um, to take your claim and the government will decide whether it will give it up or not and then everybody else's interest is taken into account in the process. So we don't have um, the systems that we need to have to be able to uh, exercise and in, enjoy our rights and then of course the obvious one there is also the issue of actual govern, governance itself. We have a number of in, Indigenous governments or Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander governments in Australia, particularly in Queensland, but also Pinjinjara Council or APY lands or whatever it is in other areas, they do act as governments and they do carry on and so on. So um, to institution uh, to deal with that in terms of the way of the political system is not to cry about a third chamber of parliament, and as far as I'm concerned, cabinet is a third chamber of parliament, but to, to talk about how, how to integrate the way that Indigenous peoples and the way that Indigenous peoples have their institutions of decision making and operating and so on, recognised, acknowledged and accepted in the... Um, in the whole political system. So there are some very practical things, I've only mentioned a few, that have already been laid out that Australia has committed itself to, along with all the other nations, which are seen to be effective ways to implement, because talking about implementing the rights has been talked about at the international level for all those years, uh, including when the declaration was being drafted up to 2007. So I hope that provides at least some of the ideas. Oh, one other thing I should... Um, no, I'll leave it at that because the, the judiciary does need some focus on it. Not because um, I want to get rid of courts or change courts, but remember that there can be new courts created and, and what the mandate of the court and even what the composition of that court is and so on. And uh, I'll finish by saying that Aboriginal representation on the courts, uh, of course, is just as important as in the parliament. Thank you, Stan. Mick, would, would you mind speaking to this as well? Because Fred did say, it was one of your comments at the press club, that this idea of being able to get the government to reopen this discussion. Uh, we know that there is the, the parliamentary inquiry underway at the moment that's hearing submissions on, on moving forward on Uluru. But what strategies, Mick, or what ideas would you have in terms of being able to reopen or re-energise that, that, that dialogue? Um, gee, Stan, you're giving me a big licence there. Mm. Um, no, I don't. I, I don't really think that it's very useful at this stage to be setting agendas, um, because I don't. If the door gets reopened, I don't think we should walk in with an agenda. Mm. We should walk in with an open heart and say, look, do you want to talk about an agenda? If they say no, we walk out again. <laughs> um, but there are certain crucial things uh, that I mentioned in my opening remarks at the press club um, that really are elephants in the room. You can't avoid them, you know. Um, Big grey thing with a long nose and big it weighs about a ton and a half and a little <laughs> short tail that <laughs> moves very slowly. <laughs> um, and takes up a lot of room, this lizard. <laughs> um, and you don't want to be around and feel the grass when they're fighting. That's another story about an African proverb. But <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I still believe that we can't isolate this, this and this. So 
Certainly we can say we'll deal with this now, we'll deal with this, we'll put this off, we'll do, you know, we'll do that. But we can't say this is on the table and this is off the table. Um, certainly for some people, constitutional recognition um, is on the table. Um, I personally don't think that's, that's that important, um, but a lot of people do. So I'm not going to stand in the way of it. It wouldn't be my priority, but it'd be on my list. Mm. Um, I think the, the, the fact of uh, 1788 and what flowed from that is something we need to address urgently. And we certainly need to address the racism or the, the capacity of our, our constitution to allow racism. That's going to be addressed. That, uh, that's urgent um, because as long as the parliament has that power and we have no say on the, what happens in the legislature, um, we're going to get done over at every turn. And our um, uh, you know, they're always holding the joker. Our cards are always going to get trumped mm. for somebody else's joker. You know? And it's usually the other 90%. 97% their interests get looked after uh, and what's left over falls off the table to us. Um, we need to stop that happening. Um, no, we need to redress 67. We need to do something about 1901. Uh, but there's this century of frontier wars that we also have to do something about. Um, that's part of the recognition. Um, I'm, I'm doing some work in Victoria at the moment around the Traditional Owner Settlement Act and the recognition settlement agreements. For TOs in Victoria, the idea of recognition is huge. You know? mm. They want that and in their agreements they said, well, you councils, if you build a new road, you've got to give it an Aboriginal name for that place. <coughs> Uh, you've got to put signs up. You've got to tell people that this is our mob's country. You've got to tell the, everybody who lives here or visits here, the, the tourists that come in here, that, that this is our land. Um, we're the traditional owners. It's really important to them. It's about identity. It's about crushing um, results of colonisation on of their peoples and their lands, you know. The mob I'm working with, about 10% of their people still live on their traditional lands. They've essentially been driven out of there, out of there you know. They've become non-entities, non-identifiable, you know. Mm -hmm. Up until recent years, no one, none of the white fellas knew whose traditional country it was. You know? That's really important to people. Mm -hmm. And I'll just tell that story because recognition is important to people. Constitutional recognition to me isn't a priority, but I know how important it is to people. Um, because I think we've got to fix the racism first, and we've got to get a treaty, and we've got to do a voice, and we've got to do a whole range of other things, you know. Um, and recognition will flow from that, I think. But I'm, I'm open-minded in this. Mm. I'm prepared to accept um, other points of view and look at those. You know? But the, thing, the important thing is that we can't stand still. We've got to bloody do something. Mm. Uh, before I open it up again to the room, Tony um, McAvoy, you raised a, a, a very specific political strategy, didn't you, in, in the meeting? And that is how you actually make the political process, the ballot box, work for you and the potential leverage that that could bring. Could you just go through a little bit of those, a little bit of that thinking for us? <laughs> I'll try and do my best. I've got some muttering in my ear. I can't. I don't know what that's about. Um, look, there's a whole host of ways in which uh, we can exercise influence and power, political influence and power. And um, one of it is by organising ourselves and organising ourselves in the, in the fashion and the manner that we see ourselves ultimately expressing our governance. 
we, we, we build those foundations now. But that doesn't mean we don't engage in the, the mainstream political system. And one of the observations I made in the group that I was in that was that the last federal election was um, decided by two seats. In Queensland, there were five marginal seats, five seats that came down to a handful of votes. And, and they were seats in, in um, Townsville, Rockhampton, the south side of Brisbane, seats which are full of Murrays. And we know from the AEC records that our, um, our voter registration, our voter turnout, um, doesn't match our population. Um, I, I think that if we were serious, we would, we would try and identify where those seats are coming into the next election and, and make a concerted effort to get as many people as we can on the roll and say to the governments, to, the gov to, to both the major parties, well, we're going to vote for whoever does the best job for us. We're going to make sure our people vote for us. And we'll, we'll, if we'd have done that in the last election, we would have delivered government to one side or the other. So we can be strategic about it. That, that was the point I made. Thank mm, you. No, good point. Anyone else wants to make a comment or a question that we could begin? There was one? Patrick. Oh, Patrick. Okay. I wanted to uh, just make two comments. Colonialism is still alive and well in Canada as you look at uh, the way the uh, frame legislation and policy in Canada is still tries to maintain uh, you know, government control. And what they do even is, uh, for example, um, they passed the First Nations uh, Education Governance Act. And they put that word First Nations Education Governance Act in there to make it look like it was our legislation, it was theirs. And it still had in there, built in, total control to the Minister of Indian Affairs. You know, so they use language. You have to really watch language very closely on how they frame things. So colonialism is still alive and well in, in, in my country. The point about elections, um, you know, it's a very uh, interesting discussion. We have such a diversity of uh, philosophical thought about that amongst our First Nations uh, because we, you know, a lot of us believe that these are not our governments. We vote for our own governments, uh, First Nation governments, and our own institutions. But a number of us have advocated that we hold our nose and strategically vote. And that's what we've been doing. And we, uh, we have the, did the analysis about where there are ridings that can be swung. And uh, you know, we've done it both for federal and provincial elections and have, have had an impact. Uh, not, not so much recently in the provincial election, but in the previous provincial election, and definitely in the last federal election. And uh, there are also areas of the country where the First Nations populations are quite significant in those ridings as well, to the point where they can control the outcome of those ridings. So those types of things have to be analyzed very uh, meticulously. The real challenge is to sustain that kind of strategy, because uh, the next time election comes around, a lot of people don't come out and vote again. Uh, we've had that, that, that problem. We were able to affect some uh, changes in writings. Uh, we were able to also uh, challenge the parties and their platforms to uh, hear our concerns and you know, indicate that we would vote with the party that would support our issues. And uh, it did have some success, but the trick is to keep sustaining it because mm. again, our people go back and say, well, I'm just voting for our own uh, chief and council. I'm only voting for our own regional chief or our own national chief. I'm not interested in, uh, in uh, this foreign governments. But again, there's a strategic vote. So uh, I know even myself, I can say that most of my adult life, I never voted in a federal or provincial government vote. And I have voted a couple of times where I've held my nose <laughs> and, and cast the vote for a strategic reason. So uh, that's a discussion I think that needs to be uh, looked at here because if you do have those kinds of opportunities to strategically vote, mm. uh, even if you don't, uh, you know, uh, have the final effect on the outcome of the government, at least the, the potential is there. I know in Canada, we're the fastest growing population. And uh, a lot of these cities and towns, and uh, the cities are growing because of immigration. 
And they're bringing in 600,000 plus immigrants a year into the country and primarily into the urban centers. And that's where a large number of seats are. But out in the outlying areas, the First Nations uh, numbers are significant. So we, uh, we, we can have an impact on, on, those, uh, on those ridings. And, uh, and, and it, has been, it has been proven to, to work. Thank you, Patrick. Um, the, the, another part of the discussion was this idea of representative structures. If you're going to have a political architecture of some type, how does it speak to the diversity of Indigenous communities, how diffuse a lot of the communities are, the dispersal historically of people who find themselves living off country? Uh, if this is going to be land-based, how does that represent people who don't live on their traditional lands and who actually has a voice? Would anyone like to speak to the idea or ask a question about the idea of representative structures and what are the potential options for them? I think, yeah, great. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Dan. Um, can I uh, thank everyone for their contributions this week and I've listened very carefully um, the first thoughts, again, not picking on Mick, but I, th I sometimes think that there's a black elephant in the room. <laughs> and I mean that sincerely because we have very seldom heard this week and in other conversations about the representative body that I speak for, those 9,000 individuals and the group of people that worked hard to establish the Congress. Are we going to dismiss their right or their choice to create a model that they decided that they wanted to represent their views and then go for something else and just dismiss that? So this is not about Rod Little. This is about representing the views of those organisations, those peak organisations that are in this room, that are members of Congress, um, uh, Les co-chair, Jackie co-chair, um, Mick, you're a special advisor to the establishment of Congress um, and many others in the room. What I want to ask of people within this room and across this nation, are we prepared to be truthful to ourselves and work together to explore what are the possibilities for ourselves and for our peoples collectively to show the love? And I know I mentioned this last week. Uh, Rom, you were in the room when I talked about love. Show the love that we have for our people. To give hope to those who are trying to manage poverty in those communities. When we're talking at this level about constitutional change, that might mean nothing to them that they might um, think that is this constitution or the referendum going to stop suicides in my community tomorrow? Those are the kinds of questions and I, I ask that people reflect on themselves and their decisions and their conversations. But as I said, are you prepared to work with the National Congress to progress to a point of where we are that we can agree on the strategies to go forward, that Congress is not to do everything, but to do something that contributes to the end goal where we want to be in the future. It may not be the perfect model, we understand that, and we are open to the solutions. We have many black people in our community that said we have got solutions, and we do have, I believe that strongly. But my plea is, can we work together a lot better than we have been, including a lot better than we have in the last couple of days? That's a challenge. And I am prepared to work with anyone, black, white, multicultural, brothers and that from overseas and sisters, to pursue the best possible outcome for us. If we get another rejection, what then? If we go to seek permission from governments to satisfy our needs, to comply with the rhetoric, then what then? What can we do as First Peoples? So if you have something already that's been established by the people, give it a go. 
It's only, what, eight years old. ATSIC was 14, 15 plus years. People began to get used to that. But we're going to throw the baby out with the bath water here. That's a challenge to everyone. Thank you. Rod, while you're there, could I get Jackie as the co-chair? Jackie, could you just speak to a couple of things I think that Rod raised there that for other people in the audience here who may not be totally familiar with Congress, mm -hmm. you could fill in how this works. How does Congress deal with those questions of the diversity uh, and the diffusion of Indigenous communities and individuals who seek to have their voice represented and the multiplicity of interests and differences of opinions and strategies and options that people might be looking for? And secondly, how do you, to go back to Fred's original point, how do you go to re-engaging with government when well, we know the history of Congress is that that relationship, particularly the last couple of years has been especially fraught. Mm -hmm. uh, on your first point, we've got, as Rod said, about 9,000 members, 200 organisations. All of our peak organisations are members of Congress in this country. So it can't be said that we're not representational. Mm. We have members from Tasmania to the Kimberley to every state and territory is covered. Okay? Now, myself and Tom Calmer, I don't know if Tom's in the room, but uh, uh, Tom actually uh, chaired the steering committee to set up the uh, uh, National Congress post ATSIC, right? It was determined by our people. We had 100 people come to an Adelaide workshop there. We were put up because we had, you know, the void of ATSIC with us. There was no national representative voice. Now, in relation to representational status, yes, our members are covered all over Australia. Um, the only thing is, of course, we got defunded in 2014, along with the rest of us, with a you know, half a billion dollar cut to uh, Aboriginal services in our country. So um, it's been very tough, very tough indeed. In fact, it's probably the toughest job I've ever, ever had in my 40 years of, uh, you know, working in these areas. So um, when we were defunded, you know, we're living off uh, some savings but also some of our um, user pays from governments and some fundraising that we do. And as you know, I had to fundraise to get myself to the UN this year, which I, I know that all the other Indigenous groups over there found quite disgusting. Um, back to your question. So... We have that opportunity, but we can't have funding to go to remotes and regional centres because we just can't get there because of the expense and so forth. Um, and what was the second question in well, relation just to Fred in terms Cheney? Of, just in terms of opening that dialogue again, what strategies are you employing to try to, to get back in the door, if you like, or even renew that oh, funding, or, or to perhaps marry yeah. the aspirations of Congress with the move for constitutional reform and the voice? Mm. Well, we've always said it's not about money for Congress, but resources help, of mm. course, so that we can get proper staff on and be able to do these travels. But, uh, you know, we've uh, re-engaged when we came to Congress, Rod and I, two and a half years ago. There was no engagement with government. We weren't even speaking with them. We had a word of wars uh, against them. Of course, along came the Redfern Statement and... The fact that we said we will not be silenced, we will not be siloed, and we'll get together our peak organisations and other national organisations to do something as a platform towards that uh, last election that we had. We did this and we've stayed together within that structure, but still we haven't had the policy shift or the change or the engagement from government that we would have sought. Mm. So, you know, whilst we've all been busting our guts virtually uh, in terms of trying to bring that uh, relationship up to par, it just has not happened. We're continually um, trying to bang at the door of governments. But, you know, as people in this forum have said in workshops that I've been in, is that uh, like ATSIC, like us, you know, the voice for our people, I really do, I really do... Um, 
um, I'm frightened by the prospect that this next voice, whatever shape, form or model it takes, will, not, will be treated like us. So, you know, this is the real dilemma that we, that we face in terms of setting up something but not using the existing structures to enable us to do that mm. because, you know, we're even at a loss as to why not. But we're there for you. As Congress, you are our members and we will continue to, you know, strive for justice for our people in this country. But if people want to come up and have a private discussion with Rod mm. and I later, mm. that, that, that's quite okay. I don't want to take up too much mm. more that's of your time. That's a good time. idea. Yeah. No, th thanks for that, Jackie. Thanks, Does anyone else want to respond? Uh, Murumu, yeah, do, do you want to respond to this idea? I, I was actually going to come to you as... No, 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 no. I'll, I'll come to you now. With this idea of representation, um, because what you're doing is quite distinct. It's, it's an innovation on this and this idea of the Adinji nation uh, and how you seek to interact with the government. If you could just fill us in on that and maybe respond a little bit as well to what Jackie has had to say. The microphone's on its way. Uh, thank you. Uh, God's peace be upon you all here today. Thank you very much. Um, I thought that just quickly, uh, I'll answer your question, but... Um, one thing that I've noticed that has been lacking is that, um, uh, the spirit. And um, I think from our point of view, I think it's really important to people to consider um, who created them and uh, uh, the, the tribal societies that exist on this continent have a, a creator and, and laws and uh, dominions, uh, imperium and um, eminence and things like that. And maybe that's something to consider when... Um, these questions arise. Look at yourself and if you're seeking the truth, I think those things will come forward. Um, from a, uh, uh, another world, uh, I can talk about uh, what we're doing. Um, we've set up um, a legal personality subject to and created uh, with the, the Yidinji law. Uh, and we've done that because we can see an issue. We can see that the constitution that Australia has, has uh, some sort of error or mistake in it. It's one thing to point it out, but it's another thing to provide a remedy. And I think that's what everyone in this room is, is, is talking about. How can we provide a remedy? Um, from the Yudinji Nation point of view, we're trying to um, assist the Commonwealth externally of the Commonwealth. A lot of these discussions I hear here are within, inside of Australia. And, um, you know, all those personalities created by and subject to the Commonwealth of Constitution Act, 1901, uh, should uphold the Constitution and, uh, you know, uh, no one should exceed the powers of the Constitution. The Yidinji Nation has a number of... Uh, has offered a blueprint towards a treaty to the Commonwealth of Australia last year. Uh, we don't want any money and uh, we're happy to um, help settle the past, secure the future, uh, to underwrite the Commonwealth, uh, all these things that people... Maybe you should consider those things, but um, uh, we're here to help. And as I say to our friends at the PMNC, that Yudinji is Australia's best friend. Um, if we're talking about treaty, if I was going to get to a wedding, there'd be two uh, people in front of me. At the moment, the Commonwealth is maybe looking to treaty with someone, but they just can't see at this moment another party there. The Yudinji government is that party right now. So there are two separate parties, and that's why John Howard, I think, said that a nation can't treaty with itself, because it's sort of internal. It's talking to itself at the moment. What the sovereign energy government has done is created this other partner to help the Commonwealth uh, continue. Um, and I think that's where we're coming from. However, if Indigenous Australians want to uh, look at remedies in, within Australia, within state-based treaties or National Congress and stuff, then that's really up to them. Um, but that's how, how we're approaching it. It's a little bit different. It's a different universe. We're aliens. Trust me. Uh, I've been abducted by aliens. And uh, so, um, yeah, that's where we're coming from. More than happy to talk about it a little bit further, face-to-face uh, -face with other people. Mm. But just at least consider that. Uh, it's very... It's a long way. It's a long, it's a long road. But we're here to help. That's all I can say to the, to the agents mm. of the Commonwealth of Australia today. Thanks for that. That does raise the question of options, doesn't it? Um, can, I, can I go to you, Dan, and then back out to the, the general audience here? 
What were options that were on the table in your discussion? What were the range of things that people were talking about? Well, one of those uh, was in fact the, the Congress and looking at uh, is, is that fit for purpose now and does that have the capability? And the only reason I didn't go through that is because there were so many that we, mm. that we talked about. But one of the things that was mentioned was around the law reform that might be required to then make that uh, useful or, or to be able to fit the purpose of the voice and the, and of, and the First Nations Forum. So that was certainly something that we discussed. And, I, and sorry I didn't mention it. I, and I realised immediately that I should have flagged that. Uh, but we talked about what legal mechanisms are already in place uh, and that being the one that, that we kept coming back to. So. Uh, Short of establishing something brand new, that was the point that we had landed on. Uh, and the other, one of the other points was around, we, there was an enormous amount of work and goodwill that went into the Uluru Statement. But after that, the Prime Minister saying no, one of the suggestions was perhaps coming back to that and, and having those delegates uh, gathering again to, go, to decide, right, where to from here? This has been the roadblock put in place by the Prime Minister on this point. Where, where as delegates, you decided on the, this structure, do you think we need to go to from here? So those were kind of the two distilled areas that we really came down to. Um, there were lots of other discussions, mm. but if, for, for brevity, I think that those were the And key. Carla, you said, I think, that there was a sense in your group that this should not proceed at a rush. You don't push ahead for the sake of it that this is part of a journey. What was the, the thinking behind that? Uh, I guess the thinking was that, uh, taking it back to, again, that question of uh, for whose purpose are we moving towards a specific goal? And if um, constitutional reform is on the table for government's purpose and not for ours, then we shouldn't rush at that. But we should take our time to consider whether or not um, as a step forward, if there is momentum towards that and goodwill and movement amongst the population that we should be able to uh, to move ahead. But rather that the, the sense is that broadly, and we saw this through, through the Recognise campaign, um, we've heard it out of the multiple different consultations that have happened since, the general Australian population uh, doesn't have that much information with respect to constitutional change. They, you know, we heard a lot around the recognised campaign that uh, people thought we had a Bill of Rights, they didn't know we had a constitution, they don't know what's in there, they don't know what the process for changing it is. Um, we heard within our group discussions about uh, the ease of, with which things can be, well not ease, the relative ease with which things can be taken out, but that adding things in, which is also one of the options, is incredibly difficult. So that we should approach that with some caution mm. and also approach this with uh, a view to bringing as many people along with us as possible and that possibly in the moves that we've seen previously specifically around reconciliation as well that what we've had in other countries with truth and reconciliation we haven't had that same process here yet and that the truth telling piece may need to come before uh, constitutional reform in order to address the relationship issues between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other Australians to prepare an environment that is ready for constitutional reform. Mm. So does anyone who was involved in those discussions want to raise any questions or, or make any comment about this idea of options and, and pace? It clearly has emerged as a, mm. as a significant issue with, with everyone here. Robert, do you want to make... Well, there, there was one other option, yeah. which I think came up in a couple of groups, it did in ours, which was to define a proposal which defines the process through which um, First Nations leadership would engage with government to define a, an option. So mm. there's a kind of process option, if you mm. like. Mm. That, that was talked about at some length. Yes, Mick, and then, then we'll come. Mick? Um, sorry, uh, well, I didn't have a choice the first time, but sorry to take the floor <laughs> again. Um, uh, I mean, this session's called, um, in part, um, you know, uh, where do we go from here? Um, and that's a question I'm unable to answer. <laughs> um, but I have some thoughts about it. Um, and um, 
my focus at least has been to try and get the government to open the door again. Um, and I haven't thought about who's going to walk through that door um, until uh, Jackie and and Rod um, raised the issue about con Congress. You know, I'm totally comfortable with Congress leading a delegation to through that open door, you know. and how that's um, comprised, uh, who goes with Congress, is another discussion we blackfellas have to have. Mm. You know. Um, so that I, I just want to assure people that from a news point of view, um, as the conveners and as the co-convener of this forum, we don't have uh, um, any thoughts about um, how the um, delegation is comprised. That's a matter for the, the Aboriginal people. It makes sense that uh, Congress ought to lead it. You know. uh, and then we have to have a discussion amongst ourselves and the people who are at Uluru about who, who's, who makes up the delegation that reignites the conversation. You know. And if, we, if the Prime Minister gives a bit of ground and says, well, I'm interested in talking about all of these things, um, we then put the bite on him so we can get as many of our people involved in supporting it. Um, the, the, we don't, I just want to reassure people, the university does not have an agenda hmm. beyond getting that door open. That was what we're trying to do. Let's hope it happens. And I'd be totally comfortable that Congress be resourced. That's a condition of going through the door be resourced to get the delegation together and to report back to everybody. Um, so maybe we can think about that. Yeah, good. Thanks. Thanks, mate. Um, yeah, that one, you, you, you'd like to you have a comment? And then, no, I'm sorry, can't they? I'm just trying to work around the back and down the front. Thank you. Um, look, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Biamy Williamson. I work for the Governance Institute. My boss is here, so I've got to be careful. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it seems to me over the last day and a half or so, there's been few people willing to push back on a bit of this stuff. So I guess I'll do it. Um, I think we really need to meaningfully identify, engage with the fact that we are still trapped in a very deficit frame of mind, a very deficit consciousness. And I think that this, a large part, this, um, this event has been testimony to that. Um, I think the scene would have been set very differently if we led with some, some of our blackfellas sort of getting up and talking about who they are, you know, where they're from mm. and, and the fact that we're still here. Um, and I think that that's my criticism as well of the Uluru Statement. It puts us as a very proud, strong people, but it puts us as proud, strong people in the past and it puts us as a hopeless, powerless people in the present. And I just, that's not my experience of growing up. Mm. Um, you know, and it was said by one of our panellists in our session that answering the question of what we want is really difficult. Uh, I don't think it's very difficult at all. You know, we just, we want our communities and our nations to have the power to choose and then have the power to pursue them choices. And in respect to this idea of waiting for a door to open, you know, and I'm not, I'm a young follower and I respect everything that everyone's, yeah, all of our elders have done and the, and the fights that they've had. It doesn't inspire me. The idea of standing, standing in a hallway up there waiting for, for, for some white wallet to fucking open the door. You know, um, what inspires me are the, you know, my mum and my nan. And um, 
neither of them ever asked any white fellow for anything. I think the only thing my mum ever asked a white fellow for was for a divorce. <laughs> But, you know, I think the idea of a truth-telling commission has a lot of merit. And um, I've seen on that sign over there, and we're talking about Mac Ryder, and it was in the Uluru Statement, it's got 2017. I think it needs to be added that it went through in the 70s and in the 80s, yeah. you know? A lot of the old people and senior people in this room were a part of that, and it does not do you justice to not have it on there. Um, But yeah, and in terms of progressing the conversation, you know, we don't need to wait for them, fellas. We, we sit on that many boards and we've got that many chairs, we've got that many CEOs. What's, there are multiple avenues of having the conversation, you know? With like, it's like there's one single partner that we're waiting for and it's, you know, it's not, it's not what, like I said, inspires me. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, thank you for that. Yep. Just down the front. Thank you. First of all, I want to say a big thank you to everyone who organised this forum. Um, I think what we really need to do as part of this whole situation is, again, coming back to your conversation in comments before, we need to visit every single community in this country to work out what our rural Indigenous people need, what our city Indigenous people need, what every Indigenous person in this country might feel are the issues holding us back. Um, obviously, that's going to take a lot of time. But as for your comments, you're right, it's time. We bust down that door. We don't wait. We need to talk to them when we're ready, not when they're ready. Thank you. Les, and then does anyone, does anyone have their hand up over here? No, Les the back, and then yeah, then thanks. And just one down. Thank you. Um, I apologise also for taking the floor again. I promise this will be the last time. I just uh, on your question of time, and we shouldn't be uh, too impatient and rush things I agree entirely, but also I, I thought it was inappropriate to just remind people that if we had back those things that we've lost since 1972, we probably will not be aspiring coming together and meeting. We would be, in fact, self-determining. I'll give you an example. For example, when the Whitlam government decided that the Commonwealth will assume all responsibility for Aboriginal affairs to ensure that there were not different rights being enjoyed by Aboriginal people in different states and territories um, was a significant change after the uh, results of the 67 referendum. And then, of course, he, uh, his government brought in the Racial Discrimination Act, and along with that there were other anti-discriminatory laws like the Queensland Discriminatory Act, which over road Queensland laws, and also, not many of you might remember, the Councils and Associations Act, which overcome the fact that the Queensland government would not register Aboriginal organisations in Queensland and provide an alternative way, not only for Aboriginal corporations to form, but actually for Aboriginal governments to form. And um, since then, so we've lost that in that legislation. They've removed that bit about Aboriginal councils uh, governance being able to form. Um, it was taken out. It shouldn't have been taken out if it was there. That's one thing we'd be enjoying now. We had the Northern Territory Land Rights Act come in 1976 following the Woodward Commission. There has been nothing like the quality of the Woodward Commission since, including looking at the Mabo decision, um, because um, it recognised that true land rights comes with control and ownership over what happens to the minerals and other developments in the, in the Territory. And the promise was that that legislation well, those rights would be conferred to all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people in Australia um, under the, a Labor government, and it was being negotiated um, to come in in 1985, and then it was suddenly pulled because of the West Australian election. Some of you might know the reasons why that happened. So we would have national land rights complying with all the rights in the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 1985 if the government had implemented 
that legislation. They'd taken the steps. They'd formed the um, Aboriginal consultative group that were negotiating on the legislation and the drafting and everything. And as I said, they suddenly pulled it. Then we saw ATSIC being put in place after the government got rid of the National Aboriginal Conference. And ATSIC has everything that we aspire to in the voice. As a voice to parliament, it was made up of representatives, it's very extensive, up to 400 elected delegates around the countryside, consisting of local regional councils, uh, national commissioners and even state bodies which were dealing with the state and territory governments. It would deal with steering uh, Senate estimates. One of the things that Mick Dodson has said, we've got to get in there and call for accountability through the Senate estimate process. Any, legis any bill that hit the table uh, in, during the life of ATSIC was met with uh, uh, a number of lawyers and, and bureaucrats uh, along with the papers to talk about that bill and whether or not it benefited Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's another thing that we aspire to about the prior informed consent for uh, any legislation and laws of matters, and that was there. Um, ATSIC was able to remodel itself. Every time they had an election, every three years, the review would be conducted to say, does this structure work for its purposes? And if any change had to be made to improve the modelling, it did that. It had a budget of over a billion dollars delivering programs and services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. It could make its own policy, it could make its own decision about the, where those um, services were delivered in what order, and that under the legislation that was intended to be made by each of the regional councils operating autonomously in terms of what they could, they could do and so on. Now, I probably uh, left out a few things as well, but I really want to say if those things were given back to us, the ones that were taken off, then um, there wouldn't be any reason, I think, for us to meet here other than to say how well we're doing. Um, so the thing about what's urgent, what's not urgent comes into question. And those things that we've lost should be urgent. They should never have been taken away. We should never be sitting in the situation now mm. where there's a, a number of discriminatory things being done, including discriminatory laws being made since ATSIC was abolished. They would never have been, ATSIC would never have allowed it during their days, uh, and so on. So um, there is a certain urgency that when it comes to equality, non-discrimination, tomorrow is not good enough, must be today. Um, in terms of other... Uh, aspirational things that we, we might underachieve, we would be able to do that as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples through our own representative organisation that was sitting right next to and, and involved with not only the national government but all the state and territory governments. So um, I'm saying this because I haven't got many years left. I've been fighting for 45 years now and um, I would like to see some results uh, in my lifetime. As you know, people like Kuiki Mabo and others didn't. Uh, but uh, I really do want to say that, yes, let's not rush into silly things, silly decisions or things that might work against us in the long term, but also let's not be patient about what is really just discrimination um, and oppression of, of our peoples. Thank you. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I won't be offended if you park this question because it's a bit like the next step. It would be awful if we walked away from having this great meeting and there was no behind the scenes diplomatic work with other people that are having this very conversation that aren't in this room. And we all know that there are some very, very heavy hitters politically um, that aren't necessarily politicians that are having this very same conversation about a model and where to go from here. And I'm just wondering, um, who is going to take the leadership on bringing the different angles of where Aboriginal people are coming from to a point where we can work towards that unity that Brooke was talking about yesterday? Mm. Sean, could I just get you to speak to that just in terms of the ANU and what, as we get to the, to the end of, of the session here, to what you're hoping the ANU can take away from this, what strategies arise from that and how do we take the information and the discussion that we've had here out to a, to a broader audience. I think we raised this question earlier, the ANU is looking at concrete measures, at putting things in place that it can actually deliver on a lot of the discussion here today. Uh, thanks, Dan. Now, I'm re like you, I'm really nervous because my boss is sitting over there <laughs> and, he, and he gets up and speaks in a minute. Uh, for those who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Sean Innes and um, along with Asmi Wood, I've been responsible for helping the content of these last few days um, pull that together. The power of the university is its ability to convene. 
And the power of that convening role is that we don't run an agenda, that we can pose questions, we can bring together people with deep understanding of those questions, we can allow discussion and debate emerge, as I think has occurred in the last two days. Uh, we, as a university, are committed to continuing this conversation. Uh, the public policy hub that I lead has a mission uh, of uh, helping create and have the deep conversations that will define the world we want by 2060, and this is definitely part of one of those important conversations. Exactly what happens next, mm. I think, depends on a few things. We will be capturing the discussion across the last two days and providing that to the parliamentary committee, which some of you appeared before yesterday. We will also be thinking, as me and myself, about what other conversations we should create. Uh, what I think we'll do is probably wait until that parliamentary inquiry has reported so that we've got at least the next response from government in front of us so that we can make a decision. I think the point you've made about the conversations that are occurring elsewhere uh, is very important and we're very keen to understand what they are because they are part of an important dialogue that's occurring not just here but nationwide. I don't know if that's fully yeah, answered your question, Stan, yeah, thanks, but Sean. hopefully that gives people a sense. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce now Professor Brian Schmidt. Um, we have come to the end of our session uh, and for Brian Schmidt to deliver the final closing remarks. Thank you, Brian. All right, well, um, I'm going to keep it relatively short uh, because I think the summing up that we have from Stan and all of you is probably the most important outcome. Uh, I'd also like to thank Sean for taking at least part of my uh, final remarks. <laughs> but I guess for me, um, this really has been a wonderful and inspiring conference, even if it is a little um, confronting but uh, that doesn't mean things cannot be inspiring and wonderful. I really want to thank everyone, too many to be mentioned, who brought this event together and have participated. Many of you have traveled a long ways to get here and used your valuable time to help us. And uh, I also would like to thank our generous sponsors. We have heard over the past couple days how Cabinet's response to the Uluru Statement from the heart has unnecessarily stymied the progress that one would have hoped would have happened after what was really a transformative consultative process. We have heard that this journey is not just the people of First Nations issue, it's an issue for all of Australia and all of its people. And as the National University, it is our role, as Sean has said, to facilitate the conversations that a nation needs to have but often decides not to. That is certainly one of the, my big uh, uh, goals of being vice chancellor, is to have conversations that need to be had. And this is our first one, because I think it is the most important. And our goal has been is to encourage discussion so that the conversation for the nation can restart and move forward. And so I am of the view that this conversation needs to be asserted uh, by the population and not by the politicians. To help us find the pathway, the Mura, that Mura, I, I'll need to have Ani Mattel to help me in language, uh, talk about, that is really what we've been trying to do, to find that pathway. And we've held it here in Old Parliament House for symbolic reasons, beginning the process with the smoking ceremony to symbolize the renewal uh, necessary to continue the conversation. And it is the intent of this foreign forum to deepen the national conversation and demonstrate what might be possible. Uh, because, as said, Australians are remarkably conservative. They're scared. And they need not be. And I hope that we have shown through this 
that the way forward is not actually scary. It is something quite the opposite, something we should be embracing. And to do this, we've invited people from around the world with similar experiences to talk about their journey so far. And I hope that has shown us what's possible. And from that conversation has come really important reminders that this is an ongoing discussion in all nations with First Nation communities, both uh, within those communities themselves and within the nation states they reside in. We have seen from the Scandinavian experience showed that democracies were not adversely affected by having a Sami parliament. We have seen the pure autonomy granted to the First Nations in North America and the fundamental way, fundamental way that First Nations sovereignty is embedded in uh, the Maori is embedded within New Zealand's governance. Uh, and those are, of course, great nations that I think we all respect and feel are our equals. I see the opportunity to create from these conversations, from this, a network of indigenous researchers and institutions from around the world. All these countries have ongoing issues, and we have so much to learn and share. So that maybe isn't so much about Australia, but that is something I think globally we can learn from this. So I will be working with uh, the National Center for Indigenous Studies to help seed this network, and of course the participants from around uh, the globe and around the country will be as a starting point of that. So I thank you for that. Moving forward, as Sean has said, the parliamentary inquiry provides an opportunity uh, for us to express the richness of the conversation we have had and make sure it is heard. There is, of course, an opportunity to think about a referendum process, but I think we have heard that there are many, many other paths that might make more sense. And that, again, is something that I think will emerge when a conversation is had. What we will be doing is collating all the ideas and feeding them to the general public, indigenous groups, and through parliamentary processes. We are open to how we might best do that. Feel free to provide advice. But we will follow up this uh, conversation with activities for at least the rest of the year to make sure that the conversation doesn't just die, that it continues. And we will do our best to involve as much of the Australian population in this conversation. But as Sean said, universities are not advocacy organizations. And so I do hope this conversation that uh, has been had uh, will gain its own sustaining energy. And I encourage the groups here to think about how and we've heard several ideas of taking control, uh, asserting your sovereignty and having that conversation. Uh, I also want to say that I was very pleased to hear the voice of the young generation here. This is fresh, it's enthusiastic, and it's optimistic, but it's firm. And I think it's a voice that we would be well served not just listening to, but empowering. And yes, they will certainly benefit from the wisdom of the elders, but I think they are likely to be the generation that is able to make the huge progress that each of us wants. So I am personally confident that we have achieved what we wanted to set out with this conference, but I recognize it is a step, a step of a marathon that needs to happen. But we need to keep taking steps, and eventually you will get your 26 miles. And so I encourage each of you who have been part of this, and I do thank you all, to keep talking with each other. Take the opportunity of the new people or the old people you have reacquainted yourself with. Keep talking to each other and keep the conversation alive. It is your voice, not ours. Uh, thank you all for joining us at uh, Australia's National University. Please come back, whether or not you're Australian or from anywhere in the world. We look forward to visiting with you. And of course, you will see us at your institutions as well. Now, I'm waiting for a four minute video to see if it has finished rendering. Is it done? If not, I'm going to have Lauren finish uh, proceedings on the dour note of buses and uh, things. Uh, but uh, once again, thank you all, and uh, I do 
I, I really, from the bottom of my heart, thank everyone's peer engagement on this. Thank you. Okay, so rather than some elevator music, um, while we're just waiting for the film, it's, it's a couple of seconds away, um, I'll just run through uh, what's happening from now for the people who need to make their way to airports and things. But before I do, I just wanted to draw your attention to the illustration again. So if you haven't had an opportunity to engage with the illustration and share your ideas on the post-its, we'll be collating all of, all of those and producing um, some digital artworks out of the wonderful illustration that Devon's been working so hard on over the course of the last two days. So I really invite you to come up and engage um, with Devon and also with the illustrations and take some pictures to go and show your um, networks what you've been up to this week. Um, another reminder is just that if you can please um, take your name badges out of your plastic sleeves and leave your plastic sleeves with the Conlog staff or on your tables. Um, these uh, little uh, name tags are made out of seeded paper from recycled paper so you can plant those when you go home. There are uh, some native flowers in there. There's a few different types. Um, we also have the buses that are due to depart very shortly from the airport, uh, to, from here to the airport. And then at 3.45 we have another one taking people back to the hotels. Um, and then lastly, I'd just like to thank all of our international speakers and domestic speakers. It's been wonderful to work with uh, in organising to get them here. And if they could please stay behind once we've seen the film, we have a little gift of thanks to give them. And um, as a last note, we'd also like to um, thank Stan Grant for coming and sharing his time with us. Um, he's been very generous with his time and um, we hope that um, he's contributed to the experience for everybody. Okay. We're fun to film. <laughs> Okay, so the film has arrived. So, yeah. Okay, so we're ready to screen the film. If everyone would like to turn their attention to the screens. Okay. It's very hard not to walk away. I would love to walk away from it all and just live on country, but you can't do that because we haven't been given that right. You know, this is where the enslavement of our rights have been taken over by the colonialistic attitudes. But a united front is what we all want. So let's stick with that, a united front. Australia National University is by its name the National University and our job is to convene the conversation our nation needs to have. And so we are trying to use our power to convene to bring people from around the country, around the world, to have this conversation in a way that we can move forward together. Can 
the claims of Indigenous peoples? Can peoples who've been colonised, who've had the state imposed on them, find a voice in the state? Can liberal democracy be enlarged to incorporate the rights of the First Peoples? That's the fundamental question. And it's not just a question for Australia, it's a question asked the world over. What we need to know about this moment in time and in history is that it is incredibly important that we need to grasp this moment with all of our hands and make the most of the opportunity that we have in front of us to really build the kind of future that we want to see in this country for our young people. Sometimes we get caught up in a fiction that the law is just set and that we haven't made the law and so the law can be changed and the law can be reformed and remade and that's something that is definitely within the capacity of our leaders and it's a discussion that we need to be having. One criticism perhaps of thinking big is oh you need to be concrete we've got to think of just steps that will be acceptable today and I'd like to make a plea for the power of imagination. We've got to think big to achieve any change. What's wrong with the Australian government and the state governments sharing sovereignty with Aboriginal people, the original people of this country? Because Aboriginal sovereignty is talking about what we once had and what was illegitimately taken away. In New Zealand, we think that we've nearly got it right, but the reality is that institutional racism pervades every aspect of our lives. So you're up against it, but you can fight back and you don't have, well you mustn't put up with it. Respect is the starting point and we have to have a good understanding of both history and the now. We have to be truthful in how we talk to each other. We all have to be sensitive to the goodwill in each other and be prepared to work across the barriers that do exist. The rights of the First Nations, the rights of Indigenous peoples, are human rights and we must not believe that any movement in this direction is a charitable act us giving them something we're talking about fundamental human rights the difference in australia is that we are an outlier in a real legal and political sense what we're trying to do now is to take that history where indigenous sovereignty was ignored or extinguished and bring it alive again today in us is the spirit of all of the people who have come before us and they're people who survived incredible scenarios and incredible challenges. So we shouldn't be surprised then to see an Aboriginal person reading the news or to see an Aboriginal parliamentarian on the floor of the House in the Parliament. I think reconciliation is achieved when we would say, well, so what? We've got a black fellow who's Prime Minister. That's what we do here. That's how we do it in Australia. We're not making any great deal about that because that's the type of society we are. Anybody's got a chance here. That's what's going to happen.